So in this section, we will talk about Abraham coming to Egypt and Joseph coming to Egypt. One thing we learn in the stories in the book of Genesis is that Egypt was a place that was very attractive to the peoples who lived in Palestine and Syria because of the Nile. The Nile ensured that almost always there was water and green plants so that the Bedouin, the shepherds, could come to Egypt during times of famine when there was no rain. You, ha you have to know that in, in ancient Canaan and Syria, everything depended on rain. Whereas in Egypt, of course, everything depends on the Nile, meaning everything depends on the rain in Central Africa, not the rain here. The Nile gets its water from Central Africa. Canaan and Syria is altogether different. You have no rivers like the Nile, and so the rain is what makes plants grow. If you get no rain, we have famine, people die. And what happens? People move. So the idea of people coming to Egypt during a time of famine, as the Bible suggests, makes very good sense. Now, let's pick up the story of Abraham in Genesis 11 and verse 31, where we read that Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they stayed there. If we look at a map, we can determine where this is. Ur of the Chaldeans is in the southern part of what is today Iraq, along the Euphrates River. And you can see the red line represents the routes of travel as much as possible beside the Euphrates River all the way up to Haran. Today Haran is just over the border of Syria into Turkey. So it's actually in Turkey today. We don't know for sure why Tira and his family decided to stop in this area or why Tira and his family left Ur to go to Canaan over here. We're not told that in Genesis 11. If we looked a little bit at Mesopotamian history, the history of ancient Babylon, we know that there were people from northern Syria and this area who over a period of maybe 100 years had migrated down into southern Iraq and we call these, we know them from ancient inscriptions as the Amorites. The great king Hammurabi was an Amorite. Several generations before his ancestors migrated to southern Iraq. Now, it could be that Tira and his family had been part of the migration several generations earlier, and now they're saying, we want to go back and live in our old land. And so this may be why they moved to this area and decided to stay. But then God comes along and tells Abraham to go on to the land that I would show you. So Genesis 12, 9 and 10, Abram journeyed on, still going towards the Negev, which is the southern part of Canaan. Now there was a famine in the land. So notice in the book of Genesis, every time there is a famine, Abraham Isaac considers going to Egypt, but God in a dream says to him, Genesis 26, don't go to Egypt, 
Stay here, I will take care of you. Jacob, once again, there's famine, and Jacob sends his family to Egypt. So this is what I'm talking about, that this was a well-known practice, and that the Bible is describing a reality when it comes to famine, the lack of water, and Egypt, of course, has plenty to drink. So Abram went down to sojourn there, and the word in English, sojourn, in Hebrew, gore, means to live temporarily. The idea was not to come to live alatul, straight on, but to live temporarily until the bad weather ended and then to return. For the famine was severe in the land. So this description is very, makes very good sense. Now what you're looking at here is a picture of a papyrus. This is the long page, this is a, an enlargement. It is a papyrus in the British Museum called Anastasi Papyrus, Anastasi. Many of the papyrus will receive the name of the person who discovered them. So if I were to find a papyrus in my excavation, it would be Papyrus Hofmeyer. okay? So Papyrus Anastasi was purchased in Egypt many, many years ago, before Zai Hawass, and it was taken to Britain, and it is written in a script Egyptologists call hieratic. It's not hieroglyphics, but hieratic. On papyrus, this kind of writing is, is, it's hieroglyphics, but it's very quickly written, not nice pictures, but very quickly written. Uh, so it's best for writing on papyrus. They don't use hieratic to write on stone, on temple walls, but this is for letters, for documents. Here's what, and there are about 10 different papyri called Anastasi. So this is from Anastasi, Papyrus 6. The man writing, the scribe writing, his name is Inneni, Innena, and he is writing from a fort in the Wadi Tumilat to his director, his superior, named Kagab. Okay? We'll show you a map in a moment of the Wadi Tumilat. And this is what the letter says. Now, we're going to look at this text now for one reason, and later today we're going to come back and look at the text for another reason, okay? So part of it I won't comment on until later. Now, this is a letter written from a fort on the border of Egypt to the commander, military commander, probably back in the Delta in Egypt. Another matter for my Lord, we have just let the Shasu, this is an Egyptian word, Shasu, would be best to translate as Bedu, like the Bedouin of Egypt. It's the, the people who live in the desert, who live in tents with their sheep and their goats, the Bedu, the Shasu. These Shasu are from Edom, and if you recognize the name Edom, Edom is the name of the descendants of Jacob's brother, Jacob and Esau. And Esau was named Edom. His descendants are called the Edomites. So here we actually have the name of one of the peoples in the Bible, and they are coming to Egypt. Why? So the Shasu of Edom, or the Bedouin of Egypt, passed by the fortress of, and there you have the name of the pharaoh, Merneptah of Cheku, to the pool, the word is Birkat, of Pithom of Merneptah of Cheku. We're going to go over the names later, okay? All I want you to see is this, in order to revive themselves and, be, and revive their flocks. To revive themselves and to revive their flocks. So here you have a group 
all the way from Edom on the other side of Sinai, southern Jordan, who have come with their flocks, and the Egyptian military has allowed them to come to water their flocks. Okay, again, so this is very similar to the situation with Abraham or later Jacob in a time of famine. They want to bring their sheep and their goats to Egypt for water. We also learn about the life of people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, how they lived in the lands of Canaan and Syria from a very important Egyptian uh, papyrus named the story of Senuhe. It's one of the most important pieces of ancient Egyptian literature, and I'm sure many of you have read the story of Senuhe in your school. But here is one of the uh, copies of Senuhe in the Berlin Museum. And here you can read the description of the life in the land. Now, let me just say that Senuhe was an Egyptian officer. He worked for the king Amenemhat I, a little bit after 2000 BC. And the king was assassinated. The king was assassinated, and Senuhe felt that he might be connected to the plot to kill the king. And so he fled Egypt. And he fled and he went to Palestine and up into Syria. And he lived during his time with Bedouin type people. People like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. People like the, uh, the Edomite Shasu who came to Egypt. So he lived the lifestyle that the book of Genesis is describing. So it's very interesting to read what his life was like. He said, land gave me to land. I traveled to Byblos, which is uh, Byblos is Lebanon today, northern Lebanon. Uh, I returned to Kedem. Not sure exactly where that is, but apparently it's east of Byblos. I spent a year and a half there. Then Amunenshi, this was the man he was uh, friends with, the ruler of Syria, Upper Rechenu, said to me, you will be happy with me. He set me at the head of his children. He married me to his eldest daughter. He let me choose for myself his land and the best of what he was his on his border with another land. It was a good land called Yah. Figs were in it and grapes, it had more wine than water, abundant was its honey, and plentiful its olive oil, all kinds of fruits were on its trees, barley and emmer, which is like wheat, and no end of cattle of every kind. So he had lots to eat, food, honey, all sorts of good things. So the picture we get from this is that life was, was good. We think perhaps of Abraham and Isaac uh, as very poor. We feel very sorry for them. But the picture we have of the lifestyle at the time of the tent dwelling, uh, I use the word pastoralists, those who take care of sheep and goats and cattle, was a very rich life. So the story of Sinuhe gives a nice background information about the lifestyle of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from roughly the same time period from an Egyptian perspective. There's something else interesting going on in the story of Sinuhe in that he uh, becomes a warrior and fights much like David and Goliath will fight. The story tells us that there came a hero, a fighter from Retinu, which is Syria, to challenge me in my tent. Now we notice that they're living in tents, just like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob lived in tents. A champion without equal was this man. He had subdued all of them. He was most powerful sheikh in the area. He said he would fight me. 
He planned to plunder me, to take my possessions. He meant to seize my cattle for his tribe. Then the ruler, that is the father-in-law of Sanuhe, spoke with me and I said, I do not know this man. I am not his ally that I should walk about in his camp. So I don't know who he is. He is not my friend. He is not my ally. I would not walk around in his camp. Why is he coming to my camp? So basically, the other man was challenging Sinuhe to fight, much like Goliath is challenging David or whoever King Saul would put forward to fight him one-on-one, -on -one, and if I win, your whole nation submits to me. If you win, the other way around. So, the next part. The fight took place the next day, and Sinuhe shoots him with an arrow, and then takes the man's ax and kills him, much like David shot Goliath with a stone, and then took Goliath's sword and killed him with his own sword. Lastly then, then I carried off his goods, I plundered his cattle. What he had meant to do to me, I did to him. I took what was in his tent, I stripped his camp, so I became great and wealthy in goods and rich in herds. So what we see here is that we have a man who's become very rich and very wealthy, uh, in this case because he fought against another champion, defeated him, and took his possessions. Now one small point that might be noted here is that in Genesis chapter 14, Abraham experienced a battle in order to protect or to uh, save his nephew, Lot. If you remember, Lot left Abraham and went to live in the city of Sodom. And then a group of kings came and attacked the city of Sodom and Lot and other people were taken prisoners and moved uh, all the way up to the northern part of Canaan. Abraham decides he wants to rescue his family member. How is he gonna do this? We come to learn in, in, in Genesis chapter 14 In verse 13, then one who had escaped from this army came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks, the oak trees of Mamre, the Amorite. Okay, we've spoken already about the Amorites. The oak trees of Mamre, the Amorites, brother of Eshcol, and honor, these were allies of Abram. So when we think of Abram, Abraham, we must not think of him as a man all by himself. We see here he had three allies from other tribal leaders. And the word ally in English is the same word we will talk about later, and it's the word for a covenant, berit the word for a covenant or a treaty. In other words, these Abraham and his friends had made a treaty so they would fight together against this group of kings. Okay. Earlier, Sanuhe says, I am not an ally of this man who wants to attack me. So this is the world of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob where different tribal chiefs will make friendship, will make alliances, and protect themselves against other uh, hostile forces. We also learn here in chapter 14 that the size of Abraham's force 
from him alone was 314 soldiers. He had over 300 soldiers, Abraham. And his friends also had soldiers. So it's possible that when Abraham led this army to rescue his family members, he had an army of 1,000, which is a good-sized army. So the picture we have of Abraham, I think, has to change. He's not just a poor man with a small tent and a goat. He is a powerful sheikh. He's a, a, a warrior chieftain with other tribal leaders supporting him. And so this is important because when he comes to Egypt, we realize he's not just a poor, uh, insignificant person. Uh, near uh, Abu Ras uh, in, in Minya, you can go to the tomb of Khnum Hotep at Beni Hassan, and here is the entrance to it. And in it is the painting that's very famous in many books. But this shows us a group of Amorites coming to Egypt um, in the 1800s BC. And this line is one after the other, okay? This is not one on top of the other, but just to get it on the same picture. So uh, the people down, oops, sorry, the people down here are, are here, okay? So you have this line of this people, and um, clearly when you look at them, you see how the Egyptians are dressed with their white linen gowns, their black dark hair, their brown skin, and these people have very different clothes, very different hairstyles, very different beards for the men, and so on. So we learn from the inscription here that these were uh, miners. They came to work in the desert to dig and to find um, kohl for the eye makeup. You understand that? The kohl, yeah. Uh, so, so the, uh, sorry, the Egyptian word here, you can see, is mesgenet, and you see the picture of the eye, mesgenet. So they were digging for this mineral, the mineral is called galena in English, they pound it and make the, the powder. Now, uh, so they were here actually with a visa to work. And you see, here is the Egyptian uh, scribe, and he's holding a visa, and in front of him is the governor of the, this area. And so they have permission to come, and we learned there were 37 in this group. 37, and they're Aamu, A or Aramites, Amorites, and they've come to work in Egypt. What's beautiful about this picture, it gives us a wonderful idea of how Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob must have looked. These are people from the same time period, the same ethnic background. So in terms of beard, hairstyle, travel, uh, all of this, uh, we have a, a nice idea. Now, one other interesting thing is, you all know the word Hyksos. The Hyksos period we'll talk about later today but this man here, he is the leader of the group. And above his head, we have the word Heka Chasut. Heka Chasut means foreign ruler, foreign chieftain. So Heka Chasut is where the name Hyksos comes from. So Hyksos really means foreign rulers. So when you say the Hyksos period in Egypt, you're talking about the period when Egypt was ruled by foreign rulers, okay? So the chieftain is called a Hyksos, Hekachasut, and we have his name, Ibisha, or Ibishar, which is interesting because the name Ibsha would be very similar to the type of name as Abraham, Av, Ram, Ibshar. It's the same family of names. So again, it, it points us to the world of Abraham. Now, a question that many people have, and I have, 
is how is it that a pharaoh of Egypt would think Abraham so important that he would want to have relations with him? And how is it that he was so impressed that he would want to take Abraham's wife? Now, we have to understand a few things. The first is, we have to understand that there are different times in Egyptian history where the kings, the rulers, the pharaohs are very different than the picture we have of the periods when the pharaohs were very powerful, like Ramses the Great or Khufu, who can make great pyramids. Now, here's our map. We can see here is Beersheba, where Abraham was living, Hebron, Jerusalem at the very top. This is on a road that goes across Sinai and comes in about to what today would be Ismailia. And on the other side, there's a little lake, Bahur Timsah. And on the other side of this is the Wadi Tumalat that I referred to earlier. This is going to be very important for us uh, later today and tomorrow because the Wadi Tumilat is one of the ways that you get in and out of Egypt. The other way to get in and out of Egypt is this road which the Bible calls the way of the land of the Philistines. This we'll see in Exodus chapter 13. Um, the practice in the Bible is that a road is named after its destination. Yani, if I'm in Asyut and I'm driving to Cairo, I'm on the road to Cairo. If I'm in Cairo and I'm driving on the same road to Asyut, it's called the road to Asyut. Okay? So here, the way of the land of the Philistines is the name of the road if you're coming from Egypt towards the land of Canaan. The road the other way was probably called by the Egyptian name the Ways of Horus, Tariq Horus, the Ways of Horus. This road is known in the book of Genesis. This is the road that Hagar travels on when she wants to go back to Egypt with Ishmael. It's called the Way of Shur. Shur is the name of the area right beside Egypt in the desert. So the road in the Bible is called the way to Shur. So because Abraham is here in Beersheba, I think he was traveling on this road to come to Egypt. Now the question is, where would he go after that? We'll, we'll look at some ideas in a moment. Oh, oops, there he goes. Okay. Now here's a look at the Wadi Tumalat, close up. Here, here is this Malia today. Here is Lake Timsah, Bahur Timsah. And you have a low valley, a Wadi. And just in this area here, there were ancient lakes. Today there's no lakes. But there was an ancient lake One of the archaeological sites, a very important one, is at more at the entrance of the wadi, and it's called Tel el Maschuta. In this case, the term Maschuta is the name of the village. We'll come back to this later. And the other uh, important archaeological site is Tel el Retabi. These two sites, Tel al Maschuta, Tel al Ritabi, have been dug by archaeologists ever since the 1800s. They work for a few years, then stop, and maybe 20, 30 years, somebody comes back and they dig a little. Now, Tel al Maschuta is being excavated by Italian uh, mission and Tel al Ritaba by a Polish and Slovak mission. So they're working very diligently in this area. Now, I mentioned the name of this zone in Arabic is Wadi Tumilat, and this is because it's named after the god Atum. The god Atum, who you see here on the right, 
this is, this is uh, a drawing of a, 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 stone, a stone inscription that was found at, P, at uh, Tel Aretaba many, many years ago, 1906, I think. And we have the name of the Atum, uh, and so Atum is the name of the god who is, is responsible for this area. And so, as often is the case, the ancient name survives to the modern day. So, Tumilat represents Atum. Now, as you know, Abraham comes to Egypt. And you may not know that the name Egypt itself derives from the name, and of course the word Copt, comes from the name of the god Ptah. Ptah was the main god of the city of Memphis, south of Cairo. Here is a temple wall still standing of Ramses II at Mitrahina, uh, and a couple statues. Here's a statue from the tomb of Tutankhamun, uh, a painting on one of the walls in the Valley of the Kings. And so when you say Egypt or Copt, the Pt is from the name of this god Ptah. So Hukupta means the, the temple of the Ka, the spirit of Ptah, the main temple in Memphis. And the Europeans and Greek travelers like Herodotus and those even before him took this name Hikipta and turned it into Egyptus, and Egyptus into Egypt. So uh, when Abraham comes to Egypt, he's coming to this land associated with the god Ptah. So now we come back to this question of Abraham entering Egypt and how is it that he establishes a relationship with the Pharaoh. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw the, that Sarah was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well. And I put the Hebrew word tov in there. Tov in Hebrew is the same word in Arabic as tayyib, um, same root. He, he dealt well or did good with Abram, and he had sheep and oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. All these things Pharaoh gave to Abram. So the question is, why does Pharaoh do this? One important key is that the word taken in Hebrew, lakach, if you take a woman, you are taking her to marry. So why would Pharaoh want to take Abraham's wife? Now remember, Abraham said it's my sister, right? So he lied a little bit, uh, but what's going on here? What I suggest we have going on here and this only makes sense if we understand, number one, that Abraham was a powerful sheikh, if you will, a tribal leader, and Pharaoh at this time was rather weak. Throughout the ancient Near East, we have many, many examples where kings marry the daughters of other rulers, we call them diplomatic marriage. Diplomatic marriage. From the period roughly 3200 to 1200 BC, we have 92 known diplomatic marriages in the Near East. 92 for which we have documentation. And I know that number because one of my students just finished his doctoral research on this subject. So, brand new study. We remember how many kings in the Bible married other women for diplomatic reasons. David married Maka, 
of Geshur. Geshur was a small kingdom north of uh, on the, today on the Sea of Galilee. 2 Samuel 3. Solomon, of course, married many, many women, as you remember. Uh, these were kings from nearby kingdoms, uh, the daughters of kings from far away as Egypt. We'll talk about that later. King Ahab married Jezebel, the daughter of the king of Sidon, Sidon, 1 Kings 16.31. So we know that this kind of diplomatic marriage was going on, and this was to secure political relationships between nations, whether they be very small or even very large nations. So why would Abraham and the Pharaoh want to have relations? I think I have an idea, but one more piece of evidence here. Here is one of the famous cuneiform, Babylonian cuneiform tablets that was discovered at Tel El Amarna in, uh, in the Minya area, Tel El Amarna. These are letters sent from different kings all over the Middle East, as far away as Turkey and Babylon. So large kings and very small kings sent letters to the pharaohs, Amenhotep III and his famous son, Akhenaten. So these letters have been all translated. You can see the tablet on the right and the translation on the left. So it reads, this one is actually written to Tutankhamun. Very few were written to Tutankhamun. From Tushrata, the king of Mitanni. Mitanni is northern Syria today and into Iraq, Iraq and northern Syria. He writes, my brother said this. So Tushrata is writing saying, my brother said this, just as you always showed love to my father Amenhotep, so now show love to me. And your father Amenhotep said this on his tablet when the official Mane brought the bride price, thus spoke my brother Amenhotep. These goods I have sent to you, I have sent to you with this understanding that when my brother hands over my wife, whom I have asked for, then I will send him 10 times more. What we have going on here is this king of Mitanni is writing to the new king, Tutankhamun, saying, your father had agreed to send a wife. And I sent him gifts, but you haven't sent me the princess yet. When you send to her, send me this woman, I will send 10 times more gifts to you. So when Pharaoh is giving Abraham donkeys and camels and all these things, this is part of the exchange in a marriage. And so uh, notice too that in this letter, the king refers to the Pharaoh as my brother. This is because in this kind of, of treaty relationship, the two kings were seen as men of equal status, their brothers through marriage. However, if the king was very, very important and the, king, the other king was very, very small, they would not refer to each other as brothers, but father and son. Father and son. So this is very important when we think about the language in the Old Testament about covenant. God is father and the king is the son. It's thinking of this kind of language, that God is superior over the king. One last thing I wanted to point out to you is notice the use of the word love, ahav, aheb, ahav in, in, in Hebrew, ahav in Babylonian. This word love, uh, unfortunately, in modern times, we read this word in the Bible and we easily think in romantic terms. But ahav is used in diplomatic language. 
So when we read that David loved Jonathan, and Jonathan loved David, or that the, the king of Tyre, Hiram, loved David, it means that they had a diplomatic relationship. They had a treaty, and they were faithful to, the, to keep the treaty. So these are very, very important. Now, where does Bible history and Egyptian history meet? This is the big problem. In Genesis, in Exodus, we meet Egyptian kings, only called king or pharaoh, never a name. If we had the name of a pharaoh, then we would know roughly when that king lived. If we look at the numbers, we're going to talk a little bit tomorrow about how Egyptian chronology helps us to establish the chronology or the dates in the Bible. One of the important one is the year 967. This has to do with the building of the temple during the reign of Solomon. So for today, just take my word that this is uh, an accurate date. Tomorrow we'll explain how Egyptian sources help us establish that date. So this, this is straightforward numbers from the Bible. 1 Kings 6.1 tells us that the Exodus took place 480 years after the beginning of the construction of the temple. 480 years, I'm sorry, before the construction of the temple would be the year 1447. However, this is based on the Hebrew, based on the Greek translation, the Septuagint, the numbers are different. It's 440, which would make the Exodus 1407, not 1447. There's another difference between the Greek and the Hebrew, and of course scholars will debate which is the number that's most accurate, the Hebrew or the Greek. How long were the Hebrews in Egypt? 430 years, according to the Hebrew tradition, meaning that Jacob arrived in Egypt around 1877, and then we'd have to go back maybe another 100 years for Abraham's visit. Now, a big difference, the length of the stay in Egypt, according to the Greek, is 215, half, making Jacob's arrival in 622. Okay, so remember these two dates, 1877, and 1622. There's a big difference, 255 years difference. So you can see the challenge. How do you line this up with an Egyptian pharaoh? It's very difficult. The 12th dynasty dates from 1963 to 1786 BC. During this period, Egypt was ruling from the, the city of Lisht in the Fayum area. This city, by the way, is yet to be discovered and, and excavated. Uh, in fact, only in the last couple years has its location been established by satellite radar. But we haven't started to excavate yet. The 13th dynasty also rules from Lisht, and it lasts from 1786 to 1763. So conceivably, if we just go back here, according to this, 1622 could be at the very end of the 13th dynasty. However, and this is difficult, you have to follow me, because we tend to think that the dynasties, because they have numbers, one, two, three, four, five, that they all come one after the other. But in some cases, especially during a period of weakness, there can be more than one dynasty at the same time. Okay? And so what you see here is that before dynasty 13 ends, dynasty 14 
has already begun. And Dynasty 14 is in the, in the Sharqiyya area of the Delta. And the, rule, the people are the Canaanites. And we also know them as Hyksos. And they rule from the town of Avaris, which I'll show you in a minute. But this is uh, in the area of Fa'us, Fa'us. The 15th dynasty, from 1648 to 1540, again, is Canaanite Hyksos rulers from Avaris. What this means is that for a period of 150, 160 years, there were pharaohs in the northeastern delta who were of Canaanite origin. And we may understand then that Abraham coming to Egypt, speaking the same language, sharing the same heritage, may have been much more warmly received by these kings than the kings in Lisht, who were Egyptian only. Now, here's a, a map to show you uh, where we are. Um, here is Avaris Fa'us. Here is Tel el Maskuta in the Wadi Tumulat, where Hyksos material has been found. And also, in recent years, up here, just east of, of the Suez Canal, at a site called Habwa, more information has been found about the kings of the 14th dynasty. So this seems to be the area of the kingdom of the, these foreign kings, while Egypt is still has its pharaoh down here in uh, Ichtawi or Lisht. Okay, so in other words, which king did Abraham see? My suggestion is, if he came in the, if he came in the Wadi Tumulat from Beersheba, he would have had connections right away with these Hyksos kings. Now, here is a statue of one of these kings that was found at Hebwa in uh, 2005, a king named Seth M. Weschet Wehem Ankh. And another king uh, called the son of Ray Nehsi, uh, here you see him making an offering before this ram-headed god. So these are uh, two of these kings of dynasty 14 who were very small. They weren't big area. They didn't control all the delta. But they would have been in the very area that Abraham would have come into. So, Yimkin, this may be the possibility that the pharaoh that Abraham met was one of the kings of the northeastern delta, not the Egyptian pharaohs in Lisht, it's Tawi. And this may explain why they're friendly, because they come from the same ancestry, the same uh, Syrian background. Even here, uh, this is an inscription discovered at Tel Adaba from the end of the Hyksos period. And it's interesting that you can see the Hyksos were writing inscriptions in hieroglyphs. The kings wrote their name in cartouche. See the bottom of cartouche. And enough remains that we can read the name Chayan. And Chayan is a Semitic name, not an Egyptian name. And we have here the name of the son of the king, the eldest son of the king, Yanis. Again, not an Egyptian name, a Semitic name. So the Hyksos kings came from Canaan, lived in Egypt, and were really bicultural. They were half Egyptian, half Semite, and they preserved both elements of the culture. And I think that may explain why Abraham and then later Joseph was well received uh, by, by these people. So here is, um, this is uh, Tel Adaba in the Sharqiyya. Here is the Wadi Tumulat, you can see. And over here um, is uh, yeah, Avaris, the Hyksos city. And then just beside it, just to the north of it, Ramses the Great, Ramses II, will build a special city called Pyramises, the house of Ramses, which we'll talk about later today. But 
Archaeological work has been going on off and on in this area since the 1960s. And one of the great uh, tools used to understand this area, you realize you're in the fields of farmers. So the archaeologist must negotiate with the village and pay rent for one year to use their fields. They excavate, they photograph, they document, and then they fill it back up again and now it's fields. What they're doing here with these instruments is taking a magnetometer reading below the surface. Of course, this is mud. And what they're doing is identifying mud brick because the mud brick has iron in it. And uh, this is a very large area that they, they did this magnetometry. And here, I'll show you in a moment, the green lines represent walls of a fort. We'll go there in a moment. Over here are large palaces. We'll talk about them uh, this afternoon. Here you can get a good look at the results of this magnetometer survey. And you can see the lines. You can see there's a large building here. Uh, there's another building here. And you can see that there are two buildings and they're not, uh, one is turned slightly one way, the other turned slightly the other way meaning there are two buildings, one built on top of the other, one earlier, one late one. Um, so before the professor Manfred Bietak began excavating, he knew based on this that it was a palace. And uh, here is Professor Bietak showing us and we're standing on the area where he's excavating. And here you can see the bricks, but you can see it's right in the middle of a field and one of the challenges is because the delta, the water is so high, they have to use pumps. They put pipes down into the water with a, a, a pump, a tromba, and suck the water out. And that allows them to excavate maybe down a half a meter before there's too much water. So here you can see the bricks, but what we have then is the palace of the Hyksos from the 15th dynasty. So, first of all, bear in mind now that archaeological work in this area has been going on for 40 years, and only recently did they find the palace. And because everything was made of mud brick, mud does not last in the delta because of the moisture, because of rain. So, the Bible tells us that Joseph is a very important person. He is elevated to almost the top spot after Pharaoh. And so why is there no evidence of him? First of all, we remember that the information about this period, as we were just talking, is very limited. Only recently are we beginning to find about this period in this location. Even in periods that are well documented, like the 12th and the 18th dynasties, we do not know the names of many officials. We do not know the names of important officers. And the delta where Joseph lived is very pure, poorly excavated. And because of more and more towns growing, archeological sites are being destroyed. So we may never get to many of these places. Now, what can we say about the Genesis text itself? In terms of background, in terms of linguistic details, the Bible has a lot of Egyptian information. What I like to say is that we may not have evidence for the Hebrews in Egypt, but we have a lot of Egyptian evidence in the Hebrew Bible. There's a lot of evidence of Egypt or Egyptians in the Hebrew Bible. So for instance, um, many details in the story illustrate the Egyptian setting of the story, including the personal names. The people we meet in the narrative of Joseph, all have Egyptian name. Potiphar or Potipharah 
everyone agrees this means pa di para, that which Ray, the sun god, has given. So the name of, of Joseph's father in law is a um, good Egyptian name. Of course, the name Pharaoh, Pera, means great house, literally great house, and became the term for the king. So Pharaoh, Para, great house, i.e., the king. The wife of Joseph, her name is Asinat, which in Egyptian means she belongs to you. So Pharaoh says, here, take and marry Asinat. She belongs to you, which is what her name means. The name that Pharaoh gives Joseph, Zaphenach Peneach, Egyptologists have wrestled with the meaning of this for a long time. What we all agree, everyone agrees, is this last element, A-N-E-A-H, is the word ankh. So the last word is ankh. And so the question is, does it mean something like Ipi Ankh, which was a known name? So Joseph, who is called Ipu Ankh or Ipi Ankh, maybe it means something like that. This formula, Joseph, who is called, and by the way, Saf Enat in Egyptian means something like who is called. And we see this in other Egyptian papyrus. I'll show you a picture of one. We have the name of, and typically, this is when you have a man with, or a woman, with an, who's been given an Egyptian name, but the name from birth is a foreign name, a Semitic name. So for instance, here's a guy named Amenhotep, good Egyptian name, who is called Palawi. Now, uh, if you've gone to Saqqara before to visit the Steppe Pyramid, on the road in, you pass by this uh, stone formation, and the sand covered it until the 1980s, and the French moved the sand away and found all these tombs. One of the tombs here is a, of a man named Upper L, discovered in 1987. And Upper L, there it is. There's his picture. He looks like an Egyptian, but his name, Aper El, is Semitic. El, God. Aper El, or Abed El, like Abdullah. Um, so here is a man who was buried at Saqqara, and archaeologists had worked at Saqqara for 200 years, and this tomb was never found until 1987. And who was this man with a foreign name? He was the vizier, the prime minister, under Akhenaten, very important man, and yet we knew nothing about him until 1987. So when we think about Joseph, we can understand if he's buried in, in the Delta, things do not survive very well, things get covered up, even here it took a long time until this man was discovered. So archaeology can always bring us new things. Now, there are other details in the story of Joseph that is very interesting. We're told when Joseph is sold by his brothers into slavery, his, his brothers received 20 shekels of silver. 20 shekels of silver. And so the question is, does this fit the price of slaves uh, for what period? Now, if you look at the red line, this represents the price of slaves in the Bible. The green line represents the price of slaves in the ancient Near Eastern market. And so here's Joseph, and the price corresponds to the old Babylonian period when it was 20 shekels. When we get to the period of Moses and the Exodus, the price goes up to 30, which is what we have at other Near Eastern sites, such as Nuzi and Ugarit. When we get to the 8th century, the time of Assyria, the price becomes 50 shekels. So interesting, this small detail that the price the brothers received for Joseph is exactly the price in the old Babylonian period, not the period of Moses, not the period of the kings of Israel. 
So it does really reflect a very old date. One more papyrus of, of interest is the Brooklyn papyrus, fragments you see on the right. And from these we learn, and this dates to uh, around 1700 BC, 1750 BC, but it is a document from Thebes, from Luxor, and it contains the names of servants and officials working in a very large household. And we're told in Genesis that Joseph, when he first worked for Potiphar, he was in the house, um, which means working in the house. And we have on this Egyptian papyrus a title called Harry Pear, house servant. Um, he was then promoted to be the overseer of the house, that is, he became a boss of other servants. And we see this also in this document, the Imi Er Heri Pair, overseer of house servants. What this papyrus shows us is that Joseph's position as a servant, and then after he showed his master how good he was, he was promoted above the other servants. It's the same kind of structure of leadership for house servants uh, in, in a well-to-do household. One of the women named as a household servant here is a, called a Semite named Tutwit, who is called Anhu M. Hesut, the female slave or house servant. So here again you have a woman who has a Semitic name given an Egyptian name, probably because her master wants to use an Egyptian name, and she is a house servant, just like Joseph. So the picture of what Joseph did when he first came to Egypt, we have exact same evidence for other Semites who came to Egypt and worked in the home of very well-to-do Egyptians. In the Joseph story, uh, we have references to the magicians, the priests, who were called to try to interpret Pharaoh's dreams and were unable to do so. And the, the Hebrew word hartumim, which we translate magicians, actually derives from the Egyptian word heri heb, which is the kind of priest. And the priest, the heri heb, is the one who reads papyrus documents. He recites magical and, and uh, poetic uh, sayings to make magic or, or for uh, worship or for different things. So it's interesting that the Hebrew word is the actual Egyptian word for the magicians. Uh, so a very nice illustration of the Egyptian background. And these Hartumim priests will also appear in the Moses story, where they try to oppose Moses' miracles. So these same Hartumim show up. So I think that would be a good place to stop, but a, a, a nice uh, Egyptian picture here to end our, our first session. <laughs>